Settle in class, today is going to be different in quite a few ways. We're going into a whole series on Pathfinder 2e, explaining how to play it and run it, but I've seen people take one look at that character sheet and run away before even touching the book, so I figured that before we get into the weeds with this like everyone else, I'd give an overview for what everything on this sheet means and some of the mechanics alongside it. The idea is that when you actually sit down to make a character, you're going to have a lot to learn, but if you're already familiar with the sheet you're using and some of the terms, it'll be a lot easier. And if not, well, that's fine. Everyone learns different. The rest of this series will be my usual step-by-step -step process, so stick around if you're interested in actually learning the system, but today I'm going to assume that you're a little familiar with D&D 5e and just need a quick overview before you start something new, because according to comments and my analytics, that is most of you. We all good? Then let's go. First of all, I'd like to mention that Paizo actually put out a character sheet for every class, customized to their needs. There's also plenty of community-made ones for free. Assuming you're not just using a character builder or a PDF, given they sold 8 months worth of books in 2 weeks, and PDFs are about all you can get right now. Anyway, at the top we have the name of our character, the name of you, and the tracker for XP. Write down what you get if you use XP, draw a snail or something if you don't, I don't know. Ancestry is your general species, like goblin. Heritage is your subspecies, like rock dwarf or woodland elf. Your background is your profession, where you came from, that stuff. It's actually really important in this one. You'll find the list on page 60 of the core rulebook. It's quite large, but spells out the format very clearly. So if you can't find anything quite right, you can work something out with your DM pretty easy. Class is where you get your power. There are 12 in your core rulebook, but 22 officially published and incredibly customizable. Size is your bigness, and alignment is where you fall on that chart of lawful to chaotic, good to evil, and no, I'm not gonna argue about it. The next is traits, which are keywords or shorthand that things like abilities and spells will refer to. They're everywhere, they're the cogs that make this machine run. A magic item might only work for people with the alchemist trait, or you can only take a feat if you have the goblin trait, that sort of thing. Whenever an option says you have a trait, write it right here. The deity box is there if you follow one, level tracks your level, and hero points are something I think you'll like. You get one at the start of every session, but can have up to three if the DM awards them to you for cool things or daring action. Use one and you can reroll a check. Use them all and you can go from dying to unconscious but stable. But do use them because you start the next session with one, so no point in hoarding. So kinda like inspiration, but with more incentive to use them. Moving down, we have our ability scores. Strength, Dex, Con, Intelligence, Wisdom, Charisma, with a modifier up front because that's the relevant part. Oh, and by the way, you don't actually roll to get your stats. You start with 10 across the board, then your class and background and ancestry give or take points away. After everything's decided, you get four plus two bonuses to throw around however you like, as long as nothing's over 18. It lets your build choices directly contribute to your stats while leaving room for your personal traits. Anyway, below that we have the class DC. You know all those cool things your character gets from their class? Well, this is their DC. 10 plus the score your class lists, plus your proficiency, and any bonus you might get from a magic item or something. Now you might have noticed that T-E-M-L, that's your level of proficiency and it's gonna be nearly anywhere that might involve a role. They stand for trained, expert, master, and legendary, and add 2, 4, 6, or 8 to the role respectively. And your level. That means even a little training goes a long way here, especially since we have degrees of success. If the DM says to roll that d20 and you beat what they want by 10 or more, that's a critical success. If you fail by 10, critical failure. Nat 20 bumps you up a level, nat 1 the opposite. Now sometimes a critical doesn't actually do anything, like how a critical fail is just a normal fail, but if it does do something, the action or spell or whatever will have it written out. For example, a crit to dodge a fireball will dodge all incoming damage, but if you critically fail, you take more. And congratulations, we're already halfway through the mechanics I actually need to explain. I know this might be a little overwhelming, a lot of new mechanics, but just a few more tricky ones and we'll be in the clear. So take a deep breath, refocus your mind, hit that like button, and let's move on to AC. Now you'll notice the formula here. Every armor has a dexterity cap. You use whichever one's lower. Same thing that you're used to, but you'll notice we have a proficiency here. That's because anyone can wear any type of armor, but you don't get as much out of it if you aren't trained. Now notice that shield slot here? In Pathfinder you raise your shield to add it to your AC. There's also a common feat that lets you block incoming damage as a reaction. Hardness is how much you reduce the incoming damage, but you both take any remaining damage. BT is the broken threshold. If your shield's HP is below the BT, it's broken but can be fixed. If it hits zero, it's turned to dust and you need a new shield. And you do know what HP is, right? It's how far you are from dead. Now this is gonna sound complicated, but I promise it's simple in practice. When you hit zero HP, you're unconscious and slap a one into your dying box. If you have a number in your wounded box, add that as well. Every round you make a recovery check, just a straight die roll. Add one dying if you fail, take one away if you succeed. If that number hits four, you're dead. If it drops to zero, congratulations, you're no longer dying but will stay unconscious until you're not at zero. If nobody heals you, you'll get HP back naturally in a bit. You also stop dying immediately if you heal at any point of this. However you do it, as soon as you stop dying, add one to your wounded box. Next time you drop, remember what I said at the start. You start with one dying, then add whatever's in the wounded box. To make that wounded number go away, you just have to heal to full HP 
HP or treat the wound with a healer's kit. Only takes 10 minutes, so it's pretty easy to recover at first, and you'll have time to treat wounds between most fights, but if you let the enemy keep knocking you down in one fight, you're gonna stay down. And okay, that's the hardest thing I have to explain, it's all smooth sailing from here. Next we have saving throws, and we only have three. Fortitude for throwing off things like poison or a grapple, reflex for things like dodging or catching, and will for mentally overcoming things like mind control. Skills basically work like you're used to. Some have a little box reminding you that your plate mail makes it hard to swim, but just add up the boxes so you know what to roll if the DM wants you to do a kickflip. Perception works the same as the others, it just gets its own room because it's the golden child and wants to brag about having dark vision, which to be fair is worth bragging about. It's not everywhere like it is in 5e. Speed is your speed, with a little box to mention if you can climb. Now we just have space to write out our usual attacks for convenience. Even have a little box to remind us which weapons we're good with. Relevant modifier plus proficiency, with a little box for damage type and if it has finesse or whatever. Weapon specialization is just a little bit of bonus damage, don't worry too much about it. Your class will tell you what to do if you have that feature. The next page is just inventory and abilities. You're not going to actually need all those boxes, don't get scared. This is a generic sheet, but it's the spot for your class features and feats. On our left is your ancestry powers, because your species keeps giving you new powers until the end. Below this is where you write your general feats and skill feats. General feats are the ones you get every four levels, kind of like in 5e, and skill feats are little abilities you get every other level. These are things like learning new languages, or using your nature skill to treat wounds instead of medicine, or carrying more bulk. What's bulk? Bulk is a big measurement for weight. If it's an awkward shape like a sword, or it's like 5, 10 pounds, yeah, that's about a bulk. If it's small and light but you can still feel some weight, like a shoe or something, yeah, that's light. Don't worry about it unless you've got like 10 of them. And tiny things like a pencil you don't even bother with unless told. You start to slow down at 5 plus your strength mod and can't carry more than 10 plus your strength mod. It's a sort of on-the-fly way to make encumbrance matter without bogging things down. Your DM just says, yeah, it's kind of big, like two bulk, and you know you have four, so we move on. And with that, there's only one more thing we need to know. I mean, there are more things here, but nothing that really needs explaining. The top portion of the next page is just character bio and campaign notes. Even has a little place to doodle yourself, but I think you know what eye color is. There's also a page or two to track your spells if you got them, but that mostly works how you're used to. Some people get special focus spells that run up a point pool instead of spell slots, and innate spells are things a few of the ancestries can cast a couple times a day, but that's not the point. The only thing you really need to know about going into this is your types of action. Reactions are like you're used to. You can do something even if it's not your turn under the right condition. Free actions are negligible things like dropping an item, but there are abilities that use them as well. You can do as many as your DM thinks is reasonable. Finally, we have actions and activities. Pathfinder works on a three action system. On your turn, you get three actions and you can use them however you want. Move three times, move, attack, and raise your shield. One action is kind of the default. However, some things like features and spells might be listed as a two or three action activity. They're exactly what they sound like. They take two actions or three actions to perform. This includes most of your spells. Do you risk holding your ground to use summon dragon? Or do you settle for a shadow blast so you can still run away? Magic missile becomes stronger the more actions you use to cast, so how much are you going to commit? And with that, all that's left is cracking open your book and starting to build a character, or just use an online character builder. But you could wait for my ABCs of character building video. We'll be going through the whole process of character building, so stick around and hit that sub button. Thanks to my copy supporters for their patronage, you help me improve and afford equipment. Class dismissed!